Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike tech and maintenance related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down in the comments section below, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Um, this week, it's just me, because Alex is away on holiday in Girona. Uh, so our first question this week is from David Pelletier, who says, Hi, Ollie and Alex. I'm not a calorie counter, but I'm very curious about the measurements. My question is about how a head unit estimates the calories burned. I ride my bike nearly every day, and there is a 22 mile route that I've done hundreds of times. And given that each trial at each level was done many times at the same effort and speed, around 20 miles an hour average, the estimates for the calorie count on those rides um, vary a lot. And so he's, he's put them down here because he's done them in different situations. So using just the GPS head unit, it said 1,100 calories. Using the GPS and a power meter combined, it said 1,450 calories. Using the GPS and the heart rate monitor, it said 700 calories. And then using the GPS, the power meter, and the heart rate monitor, it said 900 calories. So what's going on here? Right, which measurement should you trust more? Because if you're trying to work out that sort of rough energy in, energy out, this could be uh, important to you. First and foremost, the GPS is just estimating it based on distance and rough approximations of what humans do. It might also take into consideration your weight, if it knows your weight, and Wahoo's certainly, uh, you put your weight in as a measurement. Um, and it also might take into account other things, such as your age, your gender, um, and possibly even your ethnicity. Now, if you use your heart rate monitor, again, that's then gonna use um, an algorithmic based approach based on sort of mass data. So it's gonna go typically the average person, if they're at, you know, 170 beats per minute, they're probably going this particular intensity and burning this amount of power. But what's crazy is if you're, say, a pro cyclist and you're doing, you know, let's say Tade Pogacar, he riding zone two at 340 watts is what he said his zone two is, he's gonna be burning over a thousand calories an hour at that intensity. And his heart rate is gonna be zone two, so it's only gonna be around 140. So his calorie estimation, if he was just using heart rate, would say a much lower value than what it actually is. And that leads me on to the best thing, which is probably having a power meter, because a power meter is gonna be the most accurate way to measure your calories, because it is just basically saying what is the work done. It's measuring the work done in kilojoules. There, it's not totally accurate because the relative efficiency of one human can be different to another. So it's still making um, an assumption in that it's assuming that all humans have a set level of efficiency. And we don't. We, there, there is a slight variance from one human to the next. But that's going to be the most accurate way to do it and the one that you should trust the most. Power meter and your... Uh, your head unit. Right, next uh, comment, not a question, it was actually from Zero Friction Cycling. Um, and I, I thought this was really worth showing to you as a follow-up from something we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we said about, we were talking about measuring chain wear and the fact that when you measure chain wear, um, is it impacted by having a waxed chain? Does it give you a false reading because the, the wax interfering with the measurement when you slot the device on the chain? And Adam at Zero Friction Cycling says, hey legends, never been called a legend before. Uh, yes indeed, it is correct uh, regarding chain wear uh, measuring for wax chains. A freshly waxed chain will give a false reading as all the parts are chock full of wax and it's like pushing them. Um, so it's better to degrease your chain, clean it and measure it uh, when it's stripped before you then um, before you then re-wax it to get an accurate um, measurement. And he also says that a lot of lubricants in his experience will also give false readings of wear. So if you measure your chain when it's been lubed with something else um, as well. So it's much better to measure a chain when it's been stripped and cleaned. And I think that's a really useful piece of advice as that's something that I've not always done in the past. So thanks for that, Adam. Uh, next 
question is from Phil Dilmore, who says, Ollie and Alex, my understanding of airliners was that the foam compresses when the tyre is inflated, so there is no contact with the inside of the tyre. So I'm having difficulty understanding why airliners would slow you down. It would also be helpful if you quantify the impact, say, in watts. Um, okay, so this is a follow-up to another question we had as well, which was about um, using tyre insert airliners. So like Vittoria make the airliner um, and riders use them at gravel races, pro riders you've used them in Paris-Roubaix and they are like a run flat liner of foam that's compressed inside the tyre but when the tyre loses pressure uh, this foam is able to then expand uh, and then give you like a run flat liner inside your tyre. Now people have measured the impact of rolling resistance of having these in the tyre and they have in the measurements that have been done on drum testing and things concluded that they are in fact slower uh, and they do impact rolling resistance. As to why that's the case, yes, not entirely sure, because you're right, it is compressed inside the bed of the wheel, not in contact with the outer part of the tyre, but somewhere in the system it's contributing to more friction or, or something. I mean, there's a, a slight increase in weight. Um, but yes, there, there's, there's some slight impact there. It's something that we would like to measure more in the future um, and possibly do it something like the Silverstone uh, efficiency rig would be great to actually see more and understand more about the interactions of it and why it's slightly slowing people down but as to why we don't fully know yet but we just are reporting on the observed difference and people typically say you know it's a couple of watts um, that you're, you're going to lose by having an airliner in there which may or may not be significant to you. Certainly in a time trial, it would be significant. The next question is from 888JHS, who says, I recently unpacked my 30-year-old zip disc with gold hubs, and it's in perfect condition. Uh, so this is a time trial disc wheel. Uh, I also pulled out the same vintage Zip 440, also looking perfect. Both run tubulars. I believe that the disc will accommodate my TT bike SRAM 10 speed group set. Do you see any issue installing 28 millimeter tubulars onto the wheel and riding it again? Um, same question with the 440. Uh, what about using the tubular disc with modern front cl clincher and TPU tubes? Um, right, so in terms of like fitting the wider tubular onto that disc wheel, there's a couple of reasons why you might not want to do it. The first one is just in an older bike, clearance. Like if you've got clearance in your bike in the frame for that, yeah, like it, it'll work. But 28 is pretty big now and a lot of older bikes uh, and rim brake bikes, and especially TT bikes, struggle. And if you're going to get rub, it'll damage your frame, um, particularly around the stays. So check that it kind of fits first, but though that's hard with a tubular. Maybe dry mount that tubular on there first and then see. Um, the other thing with, with it is just the aero uh, of, of the wheel. Like primarily you're running a disc wheel and you're running a TT bike because you want it to be aero. And so putting that wide tire is gonna sort of mushroom on top of the disc wheel and it's not gonna create as, as good a shape as if it was flush uh, with the rim. So yeah, like that will be a slight impact there and I suspect that would be quite slower. And once you get going TT speeds, you know, aero um, is is more important. So yeah, I would uh, be wary of those two things. Uh, the last question this week is from Kevin McBride, who says, I'm putting my road bike away for winter. Sad times. Question is, do I have to clean out the tubeless sealant before hanging the bike up? Will it be glue by March? Well, that's quite a long time. So it's highly likely that that sealant would, will have dried up, uh, especially if the wheels are never spinning uh, by, by March. So yeah, if you have time and the inclination to do that, go for it. That would be a really cool thing to do. Um, or you could just wait till March when you get your bike out and, um, and, and do that. I've seen a lot of pro riders, well, pro mechanics, they actually, when they install sealant, they stick a little sticker on with a date stamp on it. Um, to show when the sealant was installed so they have an idea of the sort of sell-by date of the sealant and when it would need to be re replenished, which I think is a really cool idea. Or you can just set a reminder on your phone. But when you do come to remove sealant, whether it's now or it's in March, um, I would highly recommend using some sealant remover. So there's various products out there. Uh, Silka make a really good one. And this just makes 
removing of that that sealant residue uh, so much easier and you know anything for an easy life uh so yeah go for it fill your boots right uh as i said that's all we've got time for unfortunately so if we didn't get around to answering your question fire it down in the comments again and we'll do our best to get around to it uh, i'm gonna go now and have some lunch love you bye <laughs>